Welcome back to Insight Review. As we look back on the big stories of the past seven days, it's a country that spent more than a decade under martial law in the 1970s under the iron fist of then President Ferdinand Marcos. This week, the Philippines moved a step closer to a return to military rule after President Rodrigo Duterte declared martial law in the southern region of Mindanao. This, the fallout from fierce clashes between police and extremist fighters, during which a local police chief was beheaded. Duterte said he's now considering putting the whole country under martial law. Well, let's consult our guests again, Hugo Arince and Josh Lowe from Newsweek. Thanks very much for staying with us. First of all, the Philippines, it goes quiet, it becomes notorious, goes quiet again. But Duterte is turning out to be quite a, a noisy character, isn't he? I think, um, you know, if I lived in the Philippines, I would be worried uh, about a return to the sort of turmoil of the 1970s, as you mentioned there. But I think for those of us around the rest of the world, what's really illustrative about this episode and about Duterte in general um, is that when I talk to people who work in the humanitarian sector, who work for charities, what they talk about is a kind of gradual erosion of the norms that preserve human rights and sort of govern normal behavior for governments around the world. And if you look at Duterte, this is someone who, according to a leak to the Philippine press, was praised by by Trump for his current fight against the war on drugs, which has been criticized for breaking all sorts of human rights norms. Now, once you give someone like that a bit of a carte blanche, they're going to see how far they can keep pushing the envelope. Indeed. And he's been encouraged already by the government in Beijing and by Vladimir Putin as well. He loathed Obama, that was clear. Uh, now, better mood music coming from the White House encouraging him, as Josh says, to clamp down. Yeah, but what's so disturbing is this is a democratically elected president, and I don't think it was any surprise what he was capable of. He had rhetoric that was very um, uh, controversial and provocative, and he told people what he was going to do, and yet thousands of people have died now at the hands of this, you know, drug policy, and yet, again, this is one more step that moves you forward. So. It's unfortunate, but it's really not that surprising because I think he said clearly that he was capable of using violence in the name of justice. And here becomes one more um, thread he gets to pull. And, and again, you look at history, it's not surprising. One person can use a soul you know, situation and then make it the basis in which to sweep away civil liberties, um, rule of law, justice, all these things, and people should be asking themselves, when, when politicians are saying that we need to do this in the name of protecting you, this is the fine line. And again, we're in Britain having the conversation about the bombing earlier this week. This is the debate. How much do you allow your government to um, restrict your civil liberties in the name of keeping you safe? Because with the wrong person, it's, it's not many steps removed from really what you're seeing now. Uh, there, is, there is a troubling rise of, of this kind of autocratic rule around the world. We know that. Um, the Filipinos tried with Cory Aquino to go down a more modernist line. Um, it seems that because it's such a complicated archipelago, and remember that Duterte is the first president of the Philippines to have actually come from Mindanao, where he's put in this martial law, but it seems that it's, it's almost ungovernable, that the only way to make it and survive in, uh, in the government of Manila is to be hardline. Well, increasingly, as you say, uh, what we're seeing is populations that are increasingly scared, that are maybe influenced by the spread of all sorts of rumors and so-called fake news on social media. It makes it very difficult to sustain moderate centrist government, even in uh, you know very wealthy, very happy, very united countries. And so when you have a country like the Philippines, which, as you say, is very divided, it must be difficult to sustain your position in power without pandering to those sort of baser urges. What do you think about the White House take on this? I mean, at the moment, they seem to be purely encouraging because, as you mentioned, the, the drugs policies, uh, but it also stokes other fires as well if you offer unbridled approval. I was in Germany this weekend uh, in Berlin for the first time and took a tour, and the tour guide made the comment that the definition of extremism is simple answers to complex situations. And I just, that really sat with me. And I think, again, when you don't recognize that all of the pieces that fall into a situation, yet somebody is telling you, I'm going to keep you safe and this is how I'm going to do it. Again, I think that's very much in line <coughs> with the Trump philosophy. I'm going to drill down and kind of dumb it down to these, these tweets and these basic responses um, to very complex situations. Obviously, it doesn't make people feel better because they just want an answer, they just want a solution. But I think that's the problem is that people don't have enough information and they're perhaps not educated to understand all the issues that go into it. 
Finally this week, we move to Taiwan, which may soon be the first country in Asia to allow same-sex marriage. The country's top court ruled the current laws, which prevent members of the same sex from marrying, are in violation of Taiwan's constitution. Judges have given Parliament two years to either amend the laws or pass new ones. Oh, Ugo Arinse and Josh Lowe are here still with their take on that. Um, something of a spearhead, because it's the first kind of developed government in Asia to come up with this. One feels that the LGBT community will seize that as an opportunity to push things further. Well, yeah, I think they should. And I think we've certainly seen in places like the United States where I think over the last five to ten years, it pretty much has a snowball effect, right? So where, you know, you start having um, challenges to the laws and really questioning, um, you know, where your rights are feeling infringed, then you can certainly make that argument. And courts have looked at the, their constitutions and the laws and said that it is illegal. So I certainly think that they should be emboldened and it's hopefully heading in a path where they will see um, full marriage equality at some point. I think what's interesting as well with Taiwan is that these are countries in that part of the world that have much less immigration. They're, they're, they're much less uh, variety of ethnic groupings in those societies. This kind of advance in the Western world has come because of different kind of communities starting to learn more tolerance and come together and so on. But this is a, this is a breakthrough uh, in, uh, in a country where there are fewer immigrants and that of course will presumably be of great interest to the LGBT communities in Japan and China and other parts in Indonesia. I think most definitely in those places, but I also think where it's going to be really interesting to watch is Australia, where many opponents of gay marriage um, have held up the argument that nowhere else in Asia has gay marriage, and they kind of place Australia geographically as within that part of the world. And so now that you have somewhere in Asia which is a much less diverse society, which is in some ways a less tolerant society, is moving towards gay marriage, the proponents of gay marriage in Australia are really going to be able to say, well, you have far less of a leg to stand on now. And that's what a lot of people have been saying in the Australian press. Giving Taiwan a, a leadership role, if you like, in the region. Absolutely. I mean, I think they are taking a bold step and certainly um, from a legal perspective, challenging um, norms. And as you said, for societies that are typically more homogeneous, um, it's really impressive the fact that it is homegrown um, constituents who are really bringing this fight on. Uh, the, the results of, of, the, of the consideration in public, two of the 14 justices dissented and one recused himself. And that's, in those terms, pretty much a landslide. Absolutely. And it, what it really shows is that constitutionally, um, countries where the sanctity of marriage is preserved, um, but where there isn't explicit reference to the gender or sex of people involved in that marriage, it really is hard to make a legal case that marriage ipso facto refers to a marriage between a man and a woman. It, it, it just doesn't really do that. And that's what other countries in the region are going to look at when they're approaching their own constitutional questions on this issue. Female president, Taiwanese president Tsai Ing-wen, she openly supported it and then struggled at first with the mandate once taking over. But it's been said more than once that this is, there's a lot of this is about the Taiwanese sense of identity. It makes them different. It makes them establish themselves as a nationality because of all that pressure coming from China, um, it's another chink in their armor there, if you like. Yeah, I guess, again, you, you're right. So perhaps that sense of independence really gives them another basis on which they want to rally and define for themselves what type of society they want to be. And here's a very clear opportunity to perhaps challenge um, the, the, the shadow of the Chinese government that has been on the country for, for so long. So it's, again, them allowing themselves to craft their laws and the society that they feel is best for their citizens. Ugo Arinse and Josh Lowe, thanks very much indeed for joining us. We end with our Insight Bite, and this week, as people across the world mourned for the city of Manchester, landmarks were lit up in the colours of the Union flag. From the Story Bridge in Brisbane, Australia, to the world's tallest building, the Burj Khalifa in Dubai. Red, white and blue lighting commemorated the 22 who lost their lives on Monday evening. Also joining the Sheriff's support, the jet fountain on Lake Geneva in Switzerland and Amsterdam's Central Railway Station. That's all for now. I'm Andrew Wilson. That was Insight Review.